It's hiding in plain sight. I think it's mislabeled, and it's my favorite retirement plan. Uh, it's, it, it's a hidden gem, if you will. That is Brad Clark, who is a former management consultant. He was a principal at Oliver Wyman. Later, he was the chief marketing officer at The Motley Fool, and he has now built a holistic financial planning and investment management service where many of his clients are consultants. In our discussion, Brad describes the five financial planning tips he believes are essential for independent professionals. He explains what we need to know about the different types of financial advisors, why he thinks health savings accounts are the hidden gem of retirement planning, and what the difference is between tax preparation and tax planning. Brad's advice to independent consultants centers on what he considers to be the five most important elements of financial planning. Number one, entity conversion or choice. Uh, Number two, retirement planning. Number three, insurance. Number four, paying for college. And number five, tax planning. Brad emphasizes a couple of specific points, including the fact that you can convert your legal and tax entity from one type to another. They are not irrevocable decisions. And it's worth your time to ask yourself and your advisor whether you're on the right path every couple of years. He also stresses the importance of making sure that there are no gaps between personal insurance coverage and professional coverage and provides helpful guidance on picking a lane on whether your kids are going to qualify for financial aid or not, and then coming up with a specific plan based on the answer to that question. Finally, he stresses the importance of being strategic about tax planning in a way that transcends the specific year that you're trying to optimize while you're filing your taxes. Our conversation ended with some essential guidance to finding the right kind of financial planner for your needs. It was a lot of helpful information. I've already started making some changes myself based on it and delivered in a really easy to understand conversation. I hope you get as much out of listening as I did in speaking with Brad. You can learn more about Brad on his website, bradleyclark.com. That link is in the show notes and he has plenty of additional information there that you can download. Hey, Brad, welcome to the show. Thanks. I'm psyched to be here. Brad, I'm really, really excited to have you on the show. Um, And I think we're going to talk about, you have some uh, five tips, I believe, for independent professionals to think about, you know, financial planning. And I think we're also going to talk about all the different varieties or flavors of, you know, financial advisor out there. So for someone who's, you know, has some money, maybe, you know, know, went to business school perhaps and, you know, but is still thinking, hey, I really probably need some kind of professional help. We're going to talk about all the different types of advisors that you might go to. So I'm, I'm psyched for that. Yeah, I am. I am too. So let's, uh, let's, let's jump in. Let's jump in. So first, why don't you just kind of list off the five tips that you have, and then we can explore each one in, in, a, in a little bit more detail. Okay. So the first is, is entity conversion. So not entity selection, which you, you, I think your podcast 56 covers really nicely, but I just wanted to briefly touch on uh, entity conversion for your, your business. Uh, the second is, uh, retirement plans, which sounds basic, but I've got a couple of um, you know zingers in there that hopefully will open some eyes and raise awareness. Uh, the third is uh, insurance. Uh, I think you also have a podcast uh, eleven on this one, so so I'm not going to kind of repeat that stuff, but um, I have a couple of things to say about insurance. The fourth is is uh, paying for college uh, and and how independent professionals can kind of think about that you know, thorny problem. I'll offer a framework for that. And then finally, I want to just put on the table this immense difference between tax preparation, which we are all familiar with, and tax planning, uh, which is not something that people think a bunch, a, a lot about, but is, but is actually, you know, really, really important and strategic uh, for, for independent professionals. So those are the five Areas I think we could spend a couple of minutes each on before we get to the uh, the financial advisors. All right, thanks, and and thanks for for kind of looking through the back catalog and mentioning some previous episodes. Those were that was the episode with uh, Jonah Gruda where we where who's a who's a tax partner at Bazaars where we talked about kind of tax issues independent professionals should be aware of. And we did an episode on on primarily business insurance for independent professionals back back with Doreen Stockman, episode 11. So th- thanks for checking those out. Awesome. So let's go through these. Let's start with number one, entity conversion. I'm not e- exactly sure what that means. I can imagine what it is, but walk me through what is entity conversion and why should we care? So 
everybody's probably familiar with entity selection. When we set up our business, we have to decide what type of you know, legal entity and, and, and tax entity or structure we need. And I think Jonah did a nice job building awareness around that in, in, in episode 56. I just wanted to point out that things change, right? As your business grows and, and, and whether it's going sideways or, or, or going up and whether you're hiring employees or, or, or you have a kid and want to put in a tuition reimbursement plan, I mean, there's all sorts of reasons why it regularly regularly makes sense to evaluate your entity selection. And it turns out that converting it, uh, there's two types of conversions and, and they're pretty easy. You, you can convert your legal entity from one type to another and you can convert the tax entity uh, from from one type to another. So I just want, I just, my main point is, is twofold, I guess. One is that uh, you can change. These are not irrevocable decisions and it's worth, you know, every few years asking yourself the question whether it's it's time to you know make make one or both of those conversions and and you would just want to talk to an accountant and to and or to an attorney um to to help you to help you do those and i guess the kind of choices the multiple choices are basically llc s corp and c corp are there in the us are there any others well, so it's a good question. So there's partnership and 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 sole proprietorship, and and you know there's a there's kind of the legal side of this, and there's a tax side of this, right? So, you know, one thing that's kind of interesting with some of the tax changes is if you're an LLC, you can decide whether to be taxed as an S corp or not, right? And there's pros and cons to doing that. So you may start off as an LLC, not taxed as an S corp, and then decide that you want to be taxed as an S corp. So you don't have to change your legal entity, but it's changing the nature of the taxation of, of your entity, right? So that's just an example of a, of a simple conversion. Okay. And maybe we don't um, have time to go through like, you know, every uh, consideration, but what would just an example be um, of, you know, why someone might be going along as, you know, let's say an LLC not as an S corp, and what what kind of factor would make someone say, ah, now now it makes sense to to shift and be taxed as an S corp? Let's say. Well, let's say overall income could could be a consideration, um, because an S corp, in an S corp, if you're making a couple hundred thousand, you get to then say, okay, well, let's pay pay myself a hundred of salary, and then show the other hundred as. Um, you know, dividends or, or income from the business, and then not have to pay self-employment tax on that on that second uh, that second hundred. Another trigger could be, you know, picking up employees where um, you're now going to have payroll, and you want to make sure that you can capture the 20% small business deduction. So that that may be a that may be a trigger. Um, I just want people to be kind of aware that it's worth asking every few years you know this is not a set it and forget it this is something that you want to you want to ask you know every few years okay cool so maybe on that one if you're working either with a financial advisor or if you have a tax advisor this sounds like a question you should ask and say here's my current situation here's my current legal and tax setup yeah does it make sense to think about a conversion and yeah you don't necessarily have to know all of the reasons why you might shift but at least know to ask that question Yep, absolutely. All right, let's talk about retirement plans. Yeah, so so people are probably very familiar with the standard retirement plans. I mean, I think one of the one of the interesting the first ones I want to touch on is the individual 401k. So I have a preference for that over the SEP IRA. I think a lot. I think there's a lot of independent professionals out there with the SEP IRAs, and they understand how those work, and they're simple. Um, people may think that 401ks are uh, more complicated and, and, and expensive and cumbersome. And it turns out that they are if you have a bunch of employees. But if it's just you, an individual 401k is actually quite simple to put in place and has a couple of advantages over a SEP IRA. I'm, I'm happy to mention those or we can move, you know, just move on to the second second retirement plan, whatever you'd like to do. No, yeah, let's, because I, you know, I know, a lot of people I know would have an SEP IRA, a self-employed person IRA, I guess it is. Um, yep. what, what, how is a individual 401k different and, um, and, and why, why might it have advantages? 
So, so one advantage is that it offers a Roth option for employee contributions that a SEP IRA does not offer. Uh, the second, and this is not that big a deal, but the second is the money is more protected because it's a federal qualified plan um, than, than an IRA, but again, not a decision driver, I would say. The, the third and maybe most important is that you, you can contribute a higher percentage of your income. If your income is less than 250 or 275 or so, I mean, let's say that your taxable income is you know, 150, uh, you can contribute a, it turns out you can contribute a larger portion of that 150 to the individual 401k than you could to the SEP IRA, just based on the way the math works and the fact that you're you're you have you're wearing two hats in the 401k. You're wearing the employee hat and you're way, wearing the employer hat. And the way that those the math works on those two types of contributions means that out of the 150, you can contribute a fair amount more to the to the individual 401k than you could to the SEP IRA. If you're making you know 250 or 300 or more, then both products max out at 55,000. So so there's no difference above a certain amount, but if your income is less than that, uh, you, 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 you can defer a higher percentage into the 401k. Because the SCP IRA limits you, I think, to what is it, like 20 or 25% of your adjusted gross income. So if you're making- yourself, Of your self-employment income. Of your self-employment income. So if you're making yeah. less than whatever 55K times four is, I guess 220,000, you couldn't contribute that full amount, but I guess there's different- there's different calculation then for the well in the 401k the, the kicker is in the 401k you can contribute dollar for dollar up to 18.5 as the employee and then you can contribute 20 percent as the employer so so you're just able to contribute a higher percentage of the income so so if your income is below 250 or so and your goal is to defer as much as much as possible and you've got a SEP IRA you should really consider you know, toggling that over to a 401k. Interesting. And are you allowed to have both or you have to pick one or the other? Well, you can have both, but but you can't double dip. The, the, the federal maximum is 55,000. That's the that's the total amount that can go into one of these plans. And, and, and be, I believe you can have both, but the total would still have to comport with, yeah. the, with the 55. And, and the benefit, just to be clear, is that uh, when you're making this contribution, let's say up to 55k, that is actually uh, deducted from your your taxable income, so you don't pay taxes on that amount that you put in. Yeah, you're you're deferring it. You you will pay taxes eventually, but at a at a presumably lower lower rate. Okay, got it. All right, that's super yeah. valuable. What beyond individual 401k and and to, and just how do you set one of those up? Would you just go to like a Vanguard or Fidelity so, or? Yeah. So all the main custodians offer them. So TD Ameritrade, you know, Schwab, Fidelity, Vanguard. And yeah, you can just, you just set it up as you would set up a normal account, but the application is longer. There's a little bit more paperwork. If you, once your balance is above 250, you need to file a form 5,500 each year. So there's a little bit of, you know, bureaucracy, but it's real it's real light and there's no extra expense to doing it. Okay. Well, this is news to me. I did not know about that at all. I never heard of it. So, um, which just betrays my ignorance beyond individual 401k. Are there any other kind of retirement plans we should be yeah, aware so of? This, the, the, the second one is actually not a retirement plan. It's hiding in plain sight. I think it's mislabeled and it's my favorite retirement plan. Okay. What is uh, it? Lay it on me. It's, it, it's a hidden gem, if you will. It's the health it's the health savings account. So okay. the only way to get a health savings account is if you have a high deductible health care plan, which I would re highly recommend to most people. High deductible health care plan that makes you eligible to get an HSA. And what I would have you do, I feel very strongly about this one, is contribute the maximum to the HSA, which is 6900 bucks a year. Uh, that is tax deductible. It then grows tax deferred and comes out tax free as long as you use it for um, medical expenses. So, so this is a triple tax, a trifecta of, 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 of winning tax planning. And what I have my clients do is set these guys, set these up, max them out. 
invest them in the market and not touch them. So you pay all your, your medical expenses out of pocket. You let these suckers really, really, you let it, you let it ride. And when you're 70 or 80 years old, you've got, you know, a hundred or 200,000 in one of these things. And that becomes your tax free war chest for paying medical expenses when you're older, right? So, 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 so even though it's called a health savings account, think of it as the best retirement account out there and treat it as an IRA. Don't treat it as an HSA. Wow. Okay. Um, I mean, I know people who have HSAs. I have one. And I bet I guess it's just the obvious, I mean, the sort of straightforward thing is, oh, well, health savings account, I'm going to use it for healthcare expenses and just, you know, pay <laughs> healthcare bills with them. Um, so this is uh, this kind of counterintuitive, but it, I guess it makes a lot of sense what you're suggesting. Yeah. So people make the mistake of saying that the HSA is like the FSA. The FSA, flexible spending account, has a use it or lose it characteristic. The HSA absolutely does not have that. And because of that difference, that's why we want to use the HSA as a retirement account and not as a um, spend, spending account. Okay. Now, some people might ask, okay, but what if, um, like, what happens if uh, if I die all of a sudden, you know? And yep. then, do, I mean, does the money come, like, what happens then? Does the money come out and uh, tax-free or you know, what happens then because it's, you know, not being used for healthcare expenses? Yeah, I think to your spouse, it comes out tax-free. Um, and they, uh, you know, they can use it well, as long as they use it for healthcare expenses. I think they're fine. A non-spouse beneficiary, uh, it's a good question, may very well be on the hook for uh, for taxes out of the account. Okay, but that's no worse than um, basically that'd be effectively you know, like a four hundred one k, right? Like yeah. or SCP yep. IRA. Um, you, yep. you know, when you take the money out, you pay taxes on it. That's pretty cool. So you get uh, it grows, and as long as you use it for healthcare. Which, when we get older, we're probably going to have some healthcare expenses um, that you have a pot of money for that. Yep. Yep. Okay, that's cool. Um, any other so, retirement plans? No. Some yeah, I'll people. Do the third, I'll do the third one quickly, because right, uh, cool. we have a lot to cover. So the third one is just for your higher income listeners who have a voracious appetite to save beyond the fifty-five thousand. This is also counterintuitive, but it turns out that it's very very easy and cost effective to hire a specialist um, to put together a pension plan for your business. And especially if you're self-employed and making, you know, three, four, five hundred thousand and you really want to sock away a big number, you can blow that fifty-five thousand that we mentioned earlier out of the water. Right. So so like for instance, a 40-year-old could could defer up to 148,000 with a combination of the individual 401k plus a pension or defined benefit plan that they just install for themselves in their own business. And at, by age 50, it's 213,000 that, you, that you, could, you could defer. So, so for folks who are either already high income, who, who want to save more, or folks whose business is on a trajectory to get there, I want to make you guys aware of the idea of layering a defined benefit or pension plan, solo pension plan, layering that on top of the 401k. All right. That's awesome. Uh, I do know some people who have done that. Um, and I haven't had the problem of having so much money that I can, <laughs> that I need to suck it away somewhere. But I know some people really successful who have, who have set those up as independent professionals. And I guess you have to basically hire someone who um, like an actuary kind of person who sets Correct. it up. And so there Correct. is a bit of a cost, right? Like yeah. what, a couple thousand dollars or something to get it yeah, set so, up. So there's one, I, there's one I know who will set it up for you for 3000 and then he'll do a annual actuarial valuation, which will run you another 750 a year. So it sounds like a fair amount of money, but in the bigger picture of what you're accomplishing by doing this, it's, it's, it's a pittance. Yeah. Um, and then, you would, again, sort of that vehicle would be with sort of the Vanguard, Fidelity, major kind of retirement type companies that can all do that, I assume? Yeah, the major custodians, yep. All right. That's pretty interesting. And then do you have to have a special, I mean, um, is there, do you have to have a special legal or tax structure for that? Like, can an LC do that or do you have to be an S-corp or 
some of yeah, so so that's that's getting a little bit out of my depth. I, my understanding is an LLC can can I'm almost certain can can pull this off, but the 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 uh, the actuaries and attorneys that get involved certainly the specialists that set these up certainly will will make sure that your entity selection and potential potentially conversion requirement is is taken into consideration if you want to if you want to do one of these. All right. So basically if you're if you're making a lot of money and you don't need it right now and you want to you know sock more away um talk to your tax advisor or your investment advisor and ask hey how do we think about a defined benefit plan would that make sense for me yeah exactly all right i think that was number th- wow we're still only in number two this is a ton of great stuff okay let's talk about insurance number so three. i'll skip through i'll skip through a couple of things um so i'm not going to cover because you already have the cast on business insurance. So I'm not going to lay out, you know, the different types or, or why to get it, but I will point out that when you do get it, or if you get it, it's also worth checking if there's any gaps or gray areas between your personal coverage and your business coverage. I was on the phone with a, a guy recently, an, an expert on the on the professional liability side, and I said, look, um, if I'm driving to to an appointment for my business, and I hit somebody with my car and, you know, this, it turns out I hit the wrong person and, 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 you know, I'm going to be liable for millions of dollars of lost income or something. Am I covered by my personal, you know, liability insurance, um, you know, or, or because I was traveling to a work event, would, would I not be covered by my, my personal umbrella? Uh, and, and would I then have to be covered by, you know, professional liability. And the answer, it turns out, is not clear, and it depends on the, the specifics of the policy. So I just want to make sure that people understand that they've got their personal coverages, they've got their professional coverages, and they may as well make sure that between the two of them, that there are no important, um, you know, gaps, if you will. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the second thing, and then we can move on, just I'm cognizant of the time, is I would encourage your folks, and a lot of them are, are, in, are uh, consultants who, who like frameworks, I, 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 I'd encourage your folks to think about insurance maybe differently, to think about insurance as a chief risk officer would, uh, and to think about insurance a, a, as a portfolio of coverages where you're spending a certain amount on premiums every year, and, and is your insurance budget actually optimized? And most of the people I see, it, it's not optimized. Their they're deductibles are too low and they're so they're paying too much in premium because the role of insurance is to cover catastrophic financial loss so i would just say look folks you know max out all your deductibles lower your premiums and then use that savings to fill in any insurance gaps that you have you know a lot of people with a couple million dollars of assets for instance don't carry personal umbrella liability coverage and it's cheap so again max out your deductibles lower your premiums and use the savings to um, plug in any gaps that you've got in your coverage. And would you go to an insurance broker or a investment advisor or like, you know, who is the person who can look at your whole portfolio of insurance? And it's, let's face it, it's impossible to understand all these policies as a human being. Um, You know, to, you know, who would be the person to kind of look at them all and, and, and tell you what your gaps are or maybe what yeah. you're overpaying, so, you know? So I don't think there's anybody in the insurance business who could do that because the insurance business is so siloed, right? You have ex- experts who are selling different flavors of insurance. So, 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 um, so my answer, possibly biased, would be to go to a financial planner, a comprehensive financial planner or, or you know, CFP, certified financial planner, somebody who... Uh, can take a holistic view of your risks and help you think like a chief risk officer of your life, and you know identify identify the gaps, identi- you know talk about your deductibles, and then and then point you on your way and say you, if you have two gaps, they they may or may not be able to refer you then to a product specialist, you know that's a broker that's that specializes in, in you know in that type of that type of insurance. I mean, this is not rocket science. You might be able to figure out your own gaps, but if you want help, I would, I would kind of go to a financial planner. All right, let's talk about paying for college. Yeah. So this one, I guess I want to encourage people to 
the theme here is to is to pick pick a lane, right? And so what I mean here's what I mean. When when your when your kids are kind of maybe freshmen in college, freshmen in high school or so, when they get to that age, I think you need to do a sober analysis and you need to pick a lane. And here's what I mean: if you think that you and your kids are going to qualify for financial aid, pick lane one. If you think you're not going to be qualifying for for financial aid in the coming years, you know, pick lane two. And so. So I can sh- I can share with you a back of the envelope way to figure out if you're going to qualify for financial aid if you want, or we can say, look, that's too too detailed, and let's just let's just move on and define these lanes. What do you think, Will? Let's let's set that one aside. Maybe people can follow yeah. up with you if they want. But let's just say that someone's done the analysis and say, hey, I'm like, you know, my independent professional practice is going gangbusters, and I'm probably not going to get financial aid. So so what now? Yeah. Yeah. So, so in that case, it, it, it kind of takes the pressure off trying to shield income or assets or do, play any of these games that you hear about to try to, you know, out jockey the expected family contribution formula for financial aid. And, and now you, so you, so you put your financial aid hat, you take that off and you put your tax planning hat on and you say, well, what are some, how do we make lemonade out of lemons basically? And so, and the big idea here is tax independence. You want to get your kids to be able to declare their tax independence as early as they can. And tax independence basically means that the kid is considered their own entity with respect to uh, taxes. And, and, and that means that they need to provide at least 50% of their own support. Uh, and there's a whole definition of support, which I don't think we can go into. But what I want to be clear about is if, if if you can get your kids to not only file their own returns, but to be considered tax independent based on the IRS rules, there are probably half a dozen cool strategies that then come up in terms of income shifting and HSAs for the kids and extra uh, credits that that they'll that they'll get that you wouldn't get because you make too much money, and we're talking about thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars per kid per year, if you can if you can help your kids declare their their tax independence. So 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 what turned what started as a paying for college question, then morphs into a very interesting tax planning opportunity for young adults. But you need to kind of get started with it. I would say freshman year of high school. You, you can't wait till they're in college to get the the full power of these these strategies. Okay, and and um, we probably don't have time to go all the way into the details, but that would that invo- involve like putting them on payroll or something for your company, or so having- you could do that. Another, uh, yeah. I mean, you don't have to put them on payroll, but that's an interesting one because you can income shift, right? Because by paying them, they get to pay the taxes at their marginal tax rate, which is going to be a lot lower than yours, and you get the deduction. There's something called a tuition reimbursement plan, IRS Section 127. So you can actually write off $5,200 a year um, towards your kid's education if you install that plan in in your business. Um, the, The kid can get his own HSA Right. So think about think about what we said earlier about how powerful these HSAs are. Well, if you have three kids, by the time they each declare their tax independence, they may still be dependent on you from a health insurance standpoint. But if each kid could then put that, you, you can take sixty nine hundred bucks and stick it in an HSA for each of the kids. Right. And they get all the 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 tax power of the HSA. So it's like a force a force multiplier. I mean, there's a lot of details here, but the theme is if you cannot qualify for financial aid, don't despair because there's this whole interesting list of strategies tucked under the topic of tax independence for your kids. Okay. Wow. Okay. So that tax independence, that's my takeaway from this, um, to talk to a tax advisor about, uh, about a financial advisor about, about that piece. And kind of dive into it. All right, um, and then ta- number five: tax prep versus tax planning. Yeah. So, so, so the one that's right in our face is tax prep, right? So that's what we do every year, or our accountant does every year on our behalf. We're forced to do tax prep because we're forced to file, right? And so, tax prep is about, as it sounds, preparing 
your income taxes and filing them. So that's what gets the attention, you know, 99% of the attention. Well, there's another thing called tax planning, and it might be obvious, particularly to this audience, you know, what that means, but it means being more strategic, less tactical, more long-term, less short-term. It's a different discipline. And what I have found is that a lot of accountants, because they have several hundred tax returns to file, and this is nothing against them, but if they are, if most of their business is preparing and filing returns, they've gotten, they've built an expertise in tax prep. It does not necessarily mean that they're good at tax planning. Some accountants are good at tax planning. Some accountants are not good good at tax planning. And so I guess my main point here is there are two different things. And I'm cautiously optimistic that most of the people listening to this podcast would benefit from tax planning uh, and being strategic about about, how and when to pay taxes. Uh, and, And these are topics that kind of transcend the specific year that you're trying to optimize when you're when you're filing uh, filing taxes, and so some of the things that I've mentioned in the first four tips have a tax planning uh, characteristic to them. Again, not rocket science, but just recognize the important difference between the two. Sure. No, I mean the distinction is 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 clear. It's you know tax prep is given all the decisions that you made and all the results. You know here's how much tax you owe, <laughs> and tax planning would be okay, now let's think about all the universe of possible decisions that you could make and could do and, you know, strategically what's going to make the most sense. Um, so it's, it's totally, totally different ballgame. Understand that. Um, and uh, so I suppose the first question to ask is, you know, ask your tax advisor, all right, let's, let's shift forward and think about next year um, and the following years. But I think that kind of leads us into the second part. So um, could you, could, we we want to talk about just the universe of of people who could help you on financial planning as well as sort of investing advice. But uh, I, I don't want to talk so much now about like you know, hey, advice on what stock to buy or what mutual fund to put it into, but more on this coming up with this financial plan. What's the different categories, Brett, of you know, of of people who could do that? I suppose there's some like independent people, they charge different fee structures. Some people might work for an institution. What are the different kind of categories of professional that we should be aware of? Yeah, yeah, great. So I, I, I have seven or eight, not necessarily all categories, seven or eight separate categories, but seven or eight dimensions on that you should probably be aware of on, on what types of advisors are are out there. So, so the first one I've got here is what service? What are the services? And I, and and when you cut through all the noise, I think there are only two. There's investment management, and there's financial planning. Those are the two services. And you may be a candidate for one, you may be a candidate for the other, or you may want to buy them as a bundle. And when that bundle is sometimes called wealth management, but but really there's two services: investment management, financial planning. They are sold a la carte. They all are sold as a bundle. So that's the first thing I would ask myself. The second is, am I looking for a project or am I looking for a relationship? And they're both viable. You, you may be a soloist, meaning you're a do-it-yourselfer, but you've got to the point where you think it's going to be worth dropping a few grand on a one-time project uh, like a retirement plan or a comprehensive financial plan. So are you in the market for a project or are you in the market for a relationship? Most advisors, as you can appreciate, want people who are looking for relationships. So a lot of advisors don't get involved with one-off projects, but there are some planners who, who are happy to, uh, happy to do that. Uh, the, the third one is if you do – any questions so far? Or do you want me to just like keep marching through this? No, this is great. Okay. So the third one I have here is investment philosophy. So if you are going to form a relationship with an investment manager, I think it's very important that you are simpatico from an investment philosophy standpoint. That makes sense, yeah. Not, not to simplify it, but I think there's active and passive. And passive is index fund investing. Active is trying to beat the market by picking individual stocks. And that seems to be the highest level distinction. And advisors come in one of one of two one of two flavors. Um, you mentioned, well, you mentioned independent. I think there's independent versus, I guess, what I would call 
captive, and I don't, <laughs> that may be a pejorative term, but, you know, an, an independent, you know, an independent RIA, registered investment advisor, that's, that, that just is, owns themselves. They're not owned or affiliated with any other entity. So you could go independent, or if you don't really care about independence as much, you could, you could buy from a, a big firm, arguably that has some interesting conflicts. If they're in the, in the, if they're in the advice business and the product business at the same time, you know, there are some conflicts which, which, you know, may make you uncomfortable, you know, may not, as long as you're aware of them. Um, compensation is one that's near and dear to, to my heart. If you're going to do a project, you could pay on a project basis or you could pay on an hourly basis. That's pretty straightforward. If you're going to do a relationship, this is where things get thorny and murky pretty quickly. So traditionally, the relationships were monetized through commissions uh, on, on products and trades. And I think there's enough disdain for that now that the mega trend is towards fees where, where the consumer or the client is just paying the fees directly to the advisor. And I would say 95% of investment managers charge about 1% of assets under management. So that's how they monetize their investment management and their financial planning. They monetize it through this percentage of, of assets. There's a, there's a handful of us out there this radical fringe that have rejected the percentage model and 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 offer investment management and financial planning for a fixed flat fee that's independent of portfolio size and i won't get up on my soapbox and explain all the reasons why i personally like that but that is a model that's out there it's rare it's harder to find the standard model is that 1% of uh, of assets model uh, uh, I guess credentials, you know, there's an alphabet soup of credentials. I guess a cynic would say none of them means anything. So don't worry about credentials. Um, I'm not quite that cynical. Uh, I will say that there's a couple of ones you may want to think about CFP, certified financial planner, CFA, chartered financial analyst, and CPA, certified public accountant. Those are all, you know, great the, the CFP is the really the financial planner designation, the type of person who's trained to think holistically about your financial life. And then the CFA is more of a deep dive into investing. And then obviously we know what a, you know, what a, what a CPA is. Um, the last couple that I've got are, are niche or specialty. This doesn't matter to some people and to other people, it matters a great deal. So, you know, do you want to work with, some, you know, who is this advisor's ideal client and do you look like their ideal client? So, so some people care about that question. Some people don't. And then the last one I would say is, is it important, is it important that they are local and that you can meet them face to face? Is that important to you? Um, it's certainly understandable if you, if you want to meet them face to face, but if you're willing to work virtually, it obviously opens up, uh, a lot more folks across the country that you could you could try to uh, consider working with. So that was that was a lot of info, but those are seven or eight kind of dimensions that you may want to think about if you're going down the path of of, of thinking that you may need some help. I, I would encourage you to think about those types of things. Come up with your criteria after you've thought about those and done a little bit of reading, and then just apply your criteria. Um, and if you're interested, I can give you the names of some places, some search engines to go to to find financial advisors. If that would be, if that would be helpful. Yeah, that that would be great. Like if let's say you've kind of gone through this and you've figured out, you know, your your answers to these different dimensions. And I like the way you laid it out. Um, but what would be some ways to, you know, then actually identify some people that you want to talk to? Yeah. So, so I, I think a, a common way is going to be to ask family and friends and to ask other professionals. You may ask your accountant for a referral to a financial planner or an investment advisor. I think that oftentimes that is how it happens. Um, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. However, I would stick to your guns. I would stick to your criteria. So if, if you've come up with some criteria that you feel good about, but then you ask for referrals make sure that you're sharing the criteria so that the referrals you get actually fit with those. Because I think all too often somebody will hire their neighbor's advisor, but it turns out that that advisor is actually not 
uh, not a good fit because the person hasn't thought about their criteria. In terms of search engines, um, uh, and I will reveal my bias here, these three search engines that I'm about to give are all for fee-only advisors. So, so none of the folks that you're going to find in these search engines make any of their money by selling product. They, 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 they don't earn any commissions. They, they're called fee-only advisors. Now that, so that means hourly project flat fee, but it also means percentage of assets as we've, as we've described. Uh, and they are in no particular order, NAPFA, that's N-A-P-F as in Frank A. This is two or 2,000 or 2,200 fee-only financial advisors across the country, NAPFA. Um, I think it's National Association of Personal Financial Advisors. Uh, the second one is the XY Planning Network. And as its name suggests, these are fee-only advisors that are specifically targeting Gen X and Gen Y. Uh, so that's a great, you know, a, a great resource. I think there's about 800 folks that belong to XYPN. And the last fee-only network that I'm aware of is the Garrett Planning Network. And the Garrett Planning Network specializes in hourly financial planning. So if you are a do-it-yourselfer and you do just want to validate, if you will, your direction with somebody and you're willing to pay a couple hundred bucks an hour for 10 hours or six hours, you may find that type of person within the, uh, the Garrett Planning Network. So for someone who you know, just wants the financial planning and says, look, I'm, I'm just going to put in some you know, passive Vanguard funds or whatever. I don't need so much advice on the investment management, but really want to help on the invest financial planning. And maybe they want a project and their investment philosophy is passive, but they just need help with all this stuff that you mentioned, like tax independence. How does that work? And how would I set this up and help me evaluate, you know, what's my right legal and tax reporting structure? And do I want to convert my entity? You know, f so they might get someone hourly through the Garrett planning network. Yeah, I think that's right. That's right. And you may be able to negotiate a project. I think some people are willing to do an annual check-in. So you may pay 3000 or 4000 for an upfront plan and then pay $1,000 each year for an, an, for an annual you know, check back you know, to that plan. So technically, I guess, if you did it, set it up that way, it would be a quote-unquote relationship, but it would just be on the financial planning side. And as you said, you would be managing your own you know, portfolio. Got it. And then if someone listening to the show wanted to contact you, what would be the best way to find you? You can give a website, email, Twitter, like what, how would someone yeah. reach out? So I have a very creative website address, which is my name. It's, it's bradleyclark.com. Okay. And Bradley, let's, just how, do, how, do, how do we spell that? Just make sure. That's, yeah, that's B-R-A-D-L-E-Y and then Clark, C-L-A-R-K, Dot com and I've got some uh, guides and reports there, and some relatively provocative content. You know about thing, thing things that I wish were different about my industry, if you, if you will. Um, but yeah, if you have any interest in tracking me down, that's the, that's the, a good way to do it. All right, Brad. Well, this has been like extraordinarily informative for me. Like um, a lot of things that I had not thought about. Hugely helpful, Brad. Um, thanks for being on the show. This was really great. Oh, it was definitely a pleasure. I was looking forward to it and it was uh, it was fun. Thanks, Will. Thanks for listening to this episode of Unleashed, the show that explores how to thrive as an independent professional. Unleashed is sponsored by Umbrex, the world's first global community of top-tier independent management consultants. The mission of Umbrex is to create opportunities for independent management consultants to meet, share lessons learned, and collaborate. I'd love to get your feedback and hear any questions that you'd like to see us answer on this show. You can email me at unleashed at umbrex.com. That's U-M-B-R-E-X.com. If you found anything on the show helpful, it would be a real gift if you would let a friend know about the show and take a minute to leave a review on iTunes, Google Play, or Stitcher. And if you subscribe, our show will get delivered to your device every Monday. Our audio engineer is Dave Nelson. Our theme song was composed by Gary Negbauer. And I'm your host, Will Bachman. Thanks for listening. <laughs>